Okay, we're going to shift the discussion now. We're going to talk about how you can use a lot of insight and innovation as you, as you start to look at a lot of your partner relationships, your customers and your suppliers. And uh, there's a lot of aspects to smarter commerce as we, as we talk about it, but this is one that I think is really one that is right in front of us right now. Um, it doesn't take a lot of time, I think, to, uh, to understand that there are a lot of things, a lot of friction in those relationships. And I think Tom Osterday from uh, IBM is going to talk a little bit about that. Now, Tom has been a veteran of the industry for what, 60 or 70 years now? <laughs> Something like that. But no, Tom has, been, has, has worked uh, in, the, in the old uh, print business that IBM had, the PC business that IBM had. You notice that these are all businesses that IBM's not in. I, I, I don't know what, what that says. But anyway, uh, Tom, if you'd come up and uh, entertain us with some of, your, some of your thoughts on how to uh, transform here. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks, Tom. So as Bruce opened the session yesterday, he talked about interesting times. He talked about the fact that there are many different examples out there of the things that are happening in our industry that were unpredictable. There were two key themes that I saw in the stories he told. The first is that there's a lot of risk. Risk associated with our traditional competitors, risk associated with new entrants, risk associated with geopolitical transition, risk associated with natural disasters. Hard for us to control many of those things. The second theme I heard was opportunity. Opportunity to innovate in terms of your product, in terms of your business model, and to gain competitive advantage by taking advantage of opportunity. As we look at risk and opportunity, one area that I think there's a lot of capability for us to take advantage of change is innovation in the relationships that we build with our customers, an innovation in the relationship we build with our partners. And I'm going to talk about both partners. That is the partners that help us go to market and the partners who are on our supply chain. As we look at the environment that we're in, one of the biggest challenges is that the world has changed. We are now in the era of the empowered customer. And there are really four things that characterize this era. The first is that now all customers have, have instantaneous access to an infinite amount of information. The customer can tweet about your product and talk about something they're dissatisfied with. And their comment becomes fact. It's out there for anyone to see in the future. And it stays there forever. The relationship between the buyers and the sellers is fundamentally changing the buyer now has much more control of the relationship. Being able to express an opinion about your product, being able to, to look at, uh, at your competitors, being able to gather information at any time about options other than buying your product. The expectations that we have of our business relationships are being formed by things like Amazon, where when we interact, when we buy a product, we get that product. We also get a recommendation of another product. Things happen very rapidly. There's a very high level of service. So the experience we're having in our personal lives is coloring our expectations in our business lives. So the B2C environment is really forming our expectations in the B2B environment. And the fourth key point here is that the complexity in this value chain is going way up. As we try to spontaneously and perfectly respond to our customers, we need to have a value chain that has that same level of responsiveness. So those are the three themes that I, the four themes that I think characterize the shift in, in, in the relationship between us as sellers of products, as manufacturers of products, and our customers. I think there's a very interesting point at the bottom of this chart here, where it says that 80% of CEOs believe that their brand delivers a superior customer experience, but only 8% of customers agree. That's a challenge for us to take on. So leading electronics companies are making it easier for their customers and partners to do business with them. This is my, fu my fundamental theme. The companies that are going to win are those who differentiate themselves 
in how easy it is for their customers to do business with them. Our relationships with our customers are very complex. We interact through field sales, through customer service reps, web access, various field and, and mobile sales stores, emails, EDI, all these different inter interactions occur between us and our customers. The question is, do we have visibility of this customer across all these various touch points? When someone calls in to a customer service rep, do we know who they are? Do we know how important they are to us in our relationship? And it's the same thing on the back end. As we interact with our suppliers, as we interact with our logistics providers, as we interact with our banks, our channels, the question is, are we making ourselves the preferred customer? Is it easier for our suppliers to do business with us than it is for them to do business with our competitors? Are we differentiating ourselves such that when there's constraints in supply, we are the preferred customer? All of our businesses are complex. The question is, how successful are we at masking those complexities? We have many divisions, we have many plants, various country op operations. We grow through acquisition. How do we enable our suppliers and our customers to deal with us in ways that mask the internal complexities of our operations? At IBM, we believe this path forward is called smarter commerce. Smarter commerce is characterized by four things. The first is maximizing the, the, the insight that we gain from each customer interaction. So when someone goes to our website, do we recognize them? Do we know that they are an existing customer? Do we know what the relationship is between us and their company? Do we differentiate in how we support these people based on their importance to us? Are we learning from each and every interaction and sharing that across all of the touch points that we have with our customers? And this is true whether it's a B2C environment or a B2B environment. Are we capitalizing on social and mobile commerce? Obviously, a lot of opportunity here for us to take advantage of a lot of information that's being disseminated and to participate in the dialogue. That we as companies need to actively participate in the dialogue. Synchronizing this entire value chain, being able to tie the, the supply side all the way through our, our business to ultimately delivering the customer what they want, when they want, at the price they want. And being able to manage all the way through our business in such a way that is synchronized and able to, to deliver the maximum value to our customer. And then finally, improving the collaboration and visibility for our customers and our partners having transparency in our business so that our customers or our partners know what's available, know what the status is of their order, and are able to get that information when they want it, where they want it, through mobile devices or whatever access mechanism they want. And if we achieve these four objectives, we will get the benefits of increasing margins and driving growth, which are obviously the key business benefits we're all trying to achieve. There are four key elements that we all need to focus on in our business as we try to gain competitive advantage in the way we interact with our customers and with our partners. The first is in the area of buy. It's an opportunity for us to gain a greater intimacy with our suppliers, to be, become more of a trusted customer, giving them a better forecast, giving them a better link to understand what our demand is going to be in the future and being, being valuable to them in that respect. Being able to manage contracts more efficiently. Being able to, to build a, an ongoing relationship with our suppliers that's trusted and important in each, each aspect of the way we interact with each other. Being able to market. Clearly marketing, in my opinion, marketing is one of the huge opportunities for improvement. I think that as I meet with many CMOs, they tell me they're running their business on spreadsheets and PowerPoint. And, and to, to a large extent, the, you know, the CMOs, uh, they go to the mountain, they burn incense, they chant, and they come down they, with a plan, they execute that plan, but there's no feedback loop, no measurement loop of the effectiveness of a lot of the marketing activities. We believe that it's important for us to convert marketing from an art to a science. Being able to build this personalized relationship between the company and the customer 
in every interaction. And then finally, in the sell space, being able to sell to a customer the way they want, where they want, at the price they want, and building this, this relationship that's very intimate, very close, very trusted, where there's loyalty that's built and there's advocacy that's built. And then in the end, once we sold the product, being able to service that customer flawlessly and being able to differentiate the value that we bring to that customer, not just by delivering them a product, but by delivering them differentiated services associated with that product and building our business that way. Let's talk about this marketing area because I think it is one of the most ripe opportunities for improvement. This is data that we've gathered that shows that most CMOs in the electronics industry basically focus on the data that they have when they're doing segmentation of their customer base and when they're doing transactions, buying and, 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 and the action of, of buying. But there's a lot of opportunity to improve the benefit that, that we as companies and as chief marketing officers get from areas of awareness, interest, building that advocacy, and then finally, being able to interact with the customer as they use our product and enjoy our product and benefit from our product. So we have a lot of opportunity to take advantage. We talked a lot about data here. We talked about big data. There's a lot of data that, that exists in our companies and capitalizing on that to expand the value we get from that data creates a lot of opportunity for us. So Yung Chun Lee is the leader of the Enterprise Marketing Management Organization at IBM, and I think he's characterized the change that we need to make very well. He says, we believe the winning companies of the future will have a different view of marketing, that their view, uh, they view that every communication has to be relevant, and the relevancy should be felt by the customer individually so that every communication feels like a service. The last phrase is what I think is most important that every interaction that we have with our customers, they need to perceive that as a service. Simple example, I drive a BMW and my wife drives a Toyota. I get an email from BMW and it's, it's the, the, high, the, uh, the uh, tagline is information that you need. Sounds really important, right? I open my email and it tells me about the new model that they've got that I can buy. And they may have a couple coupons in there for an oil change. When my wife receives her information from Toyota, it's much more personalized. They know what model of car she drives, they know where she is in her maintenance cycle, and they, and they reach out to her and give her relevant information. That's valuable to her. That's what we need to do as we interact with our customers. It's not spray and pray. We need to be much more targeted in the interaction that we have with our customers. And they need to be able to perceive that what we're doing with them in these interactions is a service to them, not simply us trying to sell to them. We've talked a lot about these three companies, Apple, Google, and Amazon. But you see here the revenues that these three companies have achieved, right? And the way that they have done that is by differentiating themselves in terms of customer intimacy. So when you get your, you know, I've got, I've got the iPhone. So when the Apple i5 came out, the next day I got a notification from them that the new operating system was available and I could download it. We have a relationship. When I buy a book online, I go, I go to Apple to buy that book, right? I download the books from Apple. Why? Because it's very easy. And I have an ongoing relationship with this company. You know, Google and Amazon, we've talked a lot about them. And you see the benefit over here in terms of the margins. We also talked about the fact that Amazon is, is having a hit right now in terms of its, uh, uh, its margins because of the investment it's making in additional warehouses. So the key here is, in, in these examples, we've talked a great deal about them, there are clearly cases where people have achieved customer intimacy and are benefiting from that. So let's take it out of this consumer world and the cell phone world, because we've talked enough about that, I think. Let's use the example of Cisco. So Cisco is focused on transforming their demand generation activities. Cisco sells predominantly through business partners, but they also sell through a direct sales force. So what Cisco wants to do is they want to deliver actionable leads to sales and partners. How do they deliver higher quality leads to their business partners and to the salespeople? And the way they're going to do that is by delivering insight 
The way they're going to achieve that is through market, new marketing techniques where they provide value at every interaction to engage customers and build relationships. Okay? They want, to, they want to build this intimacy between themselves and their customers, and they're going to do this by engaging the customers based on previous behaviors with compelling offers all the way through the funnel. So here's the example of a very large company selling very large equipment, very expensive equipment, and their business model is much like we talked about with Apple and Google and Amazon. Building intimacy with that customer, knowing who they are and progressing them. So here's an example. We have cookie ID 12345 comes, does one visit. They want to capture that information. But then there's Val, who has, has, uh, is a prospect. She's been to the website twice in the last three months. Eight page views and a current visit. OK, so we're, we know something about her. But then we take a look at John. John is a prior customer. He's made three visits in the prior three months, 24 page views, uh, high interest in data centers, responds emails, and participates in, uh, in events. So we need to figure out how do we help Cisco progress Cookie ID 12345 through this process so they become a John. Another example, Whirlpool. Whirlpool is a, a white goods manufacturer. They have five or six brands. They sell around the world. They recognized that they wanted to get into the e-commerce space. They wanted to be able to sell some products online directly. They wanted to be able to sell service contracts. They wanted to be able to sell aftermarket goods. They wanted to be able to sell maintenance parts. Okay? So a very complex organization. What Whirlpool did that was really leading edge and really, really innovative was they took the time on the front end to build their first website very well. They piloted it and made sure that they had it right. But because they took the time on the front end to get it right, when they wanted to propagate it, and roll it out across the five brands in the multiple geographies, they were able to. They were able to roll out 14 sites in nine months, seven languages, and do it all in one code base. So innovation in how they're executing their, their e-commerce capability. Here's another example of a company, SMA Solar. German company, growing very rapidly. They went from being a $1 billion company to being a $2 billion company in two years very successful. The solar energy industry, particularly in Germany where they have a, a large install base, is very fragmented. So they sell to many, many different companies, many distributors, many installers. So what they needed to do was make it easier for their, for their partners to be able to do business with them. So what they did was they implemented a solution that gave transparency to their, to their distributors, and to their installation partners so that they could see where their orders were in the production process. So they knew when they were going to get the products that they needed for their projects. So two key benefits here. One is that for SMA Solar's distributors, for their business partners, for the installers, for their business partners, they were able to have transparency and visibility. For SMA Solar, the great benefit they got was the opportunity to cross-sell and upsell, because they now had much more awareness of who was buying what and when they were buying it. Here's another example, Seagate. So uh, many of the companies that uh, are in this room probably buy from Seagate. They're a major supplier of, of disk drives. The challenge that Seagate had was they didn't have transparency. Much like SMA Solar's problem, they didn't have transparency in how they interacted with their customers. So what they did was they implemented a system that provided this visibility to their customers. So they could do available to promise. So they give visibility of, of you know, order dates, pricing, configure price quote capabilities. And by providing these services to their customers, they were able to reduce their order processing costs from $11 to $13 per order to, to $1. So they were able to achieve two major benefits here. One, reduce their cost as a business, but also become a much easier company for their partners and their customers to do business with. Innovation in business model. 
So JD told us some about uh, Lenovo and about Lenovo's plans in the cell phone as well as in the tablet space and, and smartphones. This reference refers more to the traditional business of Lenovo, but the chief supply chain officer for Lenovo, Jerry Smith, declared that he wanted to innovate in his supply chain process to achieve perfect order fulfillment. That's the name of their, their program, perfect order fulfillment. It was all about how do they service their customers better. Well, when they looked at what they needed to do to service their customers better, they found that a lot of what they needed to fix was on the back end of the processes on the supply chain. They needed to change the way they looked at their business. It was no longer, what is the, what is the cost per box? It was how satisfied are our customers with our service? They didn't realize that delivering a product early was as bad as delivering it late. It needed to be delivered exactly when the customer wanted it. And when they understood what the requirements were by using focus groups, things like that, they were able to put together this perfect order fulfillment program. In order to achieve those, those objectives, it was all about fixing the back end and being more responsive in terms of the communication of information between themselves and their suppliers. And by doing this, they were able to significantly reduce costs. They were able to save a million dollars and reduce the time it took to onboard a partner by 85%. So I'll give you an example. So logistics is a key thing for Lenovo because they distribute their products around the world. It took them uh, $70,000 in five months to bring on a new logistics provider. So the threshold of doing that was so high that oftentimes they simply didn't do it. By implementing improved processes and improved systems, they're able to bring on a new logistics provider in five weeks for a cost of $5,000. They now have a much more agile and flexible business system. Okay? So I think the key theme here, we're talking about innovation in customer relationships and innovation in business partner relationships. We've talked about products coming and going. You know, an example of that is Nokia. I mean, Nokia was very, very successful, but when Nokia sold a phone, they did not want to know who held that phone in their hand. Because the only reason that that person would ever reach back to them is if they had a warranty issue. So Nokia, leading edge company, lost its position in the marketplace, great product, but superseded by a company that had a better system. And I think that's represented by RIM with the BlackBerry. Their system was all about enterprise email. Lasted a little bit longer. But I think the key message here is relationships are what endure. And we need to focus on those relationships and figure out how we're going to gain competitive advantage by becoming the preferred supplier to our customers and by becoming the preferred customer of our suppliers. And I think the key element here is we need to think about this kind of like our personal relationships, right? Relationships endure, but they only endure if we invest in them and if we nurture them and if we build intimacy and we build trust and we build advocacy. So as we go forward, we've had, we've had conversation here today over, over the last two days about innovation. That's been the consistent theme, right? Innovation in product development, innovation in business model, and I brought forward the idea that I think that innovation in how we deal with our customers and how we deal with our business partners is truly a way that we can minimize risk and seize new opportunities for our businesses. Any questions? We will have the opportunity to explore this further in a breakout session this afternoon. We'll be talking about that in just a moment. But if there are no further questions, I'll relinquish the floor. Okay, thanks, Tom. Thank you. Still a lot from you.